Bon dia. Okay, so we are going to have a Ronaldo joining soon. And uh, this is very exciting and very, very exciting. Hey, here he is. So we're gonna get him to the video. And he's coming. Hello. Hola. I'm so happy to meet you. Like, I'm very excited. Yeah. I'm, I'm very nervous also, I need to admit. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to be nervous at all. <laughs> <laughs> nice okay, uh, let's introduce uh, Ronaldo Casimiro da Costa. So he is a full professor. He is a teacher, a clinician, a researcher at Ohio University. And, and obviously every resident that started studying for the board for June knows your name and is like, oh my God, I can't read all these papers <laughs> about Wobbler's disease. <laughs> And I, I was thinking about bringing my pl plexiglass uh, board for the flexion, so then you could sign. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe when I want to visit you one day. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so guys, um, you know that you need to be asking questions. I, I will start with some general questions and, and then we will get into certain subjects. But, you know, this is for you guys. Um, you ask the questions, we answer. Spanish, Portuguese, or English, we will answer in, in English, but we will yes. we'll translate the question. Right? <laughs> yes. I, I would love to answer in Spanish, but I don't think I can do it properly. Um, yes. So, yeah. So the answers can come in any language. Uh, we should be able to understand Italian and then maybe even French. Uh, yeah. But we will answer in English. We will answer in English. Everyone sure. can practice English today. Yeah, exactly. So, um, because the subject is called wobbly life, so I guess that um, I think that a lot of people, when, you know, when we hear the, the word wobbly, they just think about wobbler's disease, but actually wobbly in English means being a toxic, what we will say in neurology. So, what will be the things that will go to your head when you see a wobbly animal? So, what are the kind of big tips, or big directions that you think that a vet student or a, or, a, or a veterinarian should think when they see a wobbly, a wobbly dog? Let's, let's say with dogs, because if we start with cats, yeah, then... Yeah, great question, yeah. So, um, as I said, and um, good afternoon, everyone that's joining us. Um, thank you for using or sparing part of your afternoon like in this quarantine time to, to join us for for this conversation. Um, and thank you, Annie, for, for inviting me. Um, muchas gracias. Um, so I would say that when we talk about ataxia, it, um, and I was actually just talking to a vet recently about it, because she said, oh, this, this, this dog is ataxic. And I said, okay, well, when we, we talk about ataxia, I think it's important that we, we start by subdividing it. Um, the ataxia that we see with wobbler dogs is the proprioceptive ataxia. Some people call it spinal ataxia, sensory ataxia. Sensory, I think it's wrong because mm. the, like, the vestibular is also sensory. It's a mm -hmm. sensory system, but that, that's just my opinion. But I'd say the, the classic like spinal cord associated disease, that's proprioceptive ataxia. But we also have vestibular and cerebellar ataxias, which are like, you know, everything about neurology it, it, like everything is about lesion localization. So, you know, it doesn't matter, like I teach my students, it doesn't matter if you have a fancy MRI, a fancy CT, if you can't localize lesion. So that's mm -hmm. the key thing, that's the basis of neurology. And so ataxia is a very, very important sign. And ataxia is like, you know, the wobbliness, like you see cats that have very severe cerebral ataxia, they're very, very wobbly. But I think when we look at the patients, we have to approach that wobbliness by asking ourselves, is that a toxic? Yes. If so, which kind? And I, I, I have a simple rule, like that doesn't always work, but I, I think it's important to share. Look at the patient's head, look at the dog's head. Do you see any evidence of tremors? Do you see any evidence of tilt? Whatever degree of head tilt the patient may have. Mm -hmm. If the answer is no, so there's no tremors, there's no head toot, no head tremors, no head toot, then most likely we're dealing with a case of proprioceptive ataxia. And as such, 
90, I don't know, 98 percent of those cases, the lesion will be from C1 down along the spinal cords. Um, and when we're talking about proprioceptive ataxia, I think it's worth mentioning too that proprioceptive ataxia is a dysfunction of the white matter of the spinal cord. So not um, when we talk about spinal cord diseases like myelopathies, there's you know, spinal cord has both white and gray matter. We use the, the gray matter like to, you know, clinically heavily for lesion localization using the mm -hmm. lower more immune principle. And the white matter is kind of what tells us about it. Like, when it shows any sign of dysfunction, it will range from, you know, like ataxia to paresis to paralysis and all of that. So I think that uh, I don't know the level of the crowd, but I think it's important that we, we make that distinction so people understand that. Just saying ataxia, it helps, but ideally it, it should, it will help a lot more if we were able to, to, to go a step further and subdivide it and then, and then we obviously progress and evolve into yeah. the process of lesion localization. Yeah, and I think that also one thing that I try to teach a lot of the students, which Sometimes it's obviously not difficult to recognize the difference between ataxia and paresis because people know the word ataxia and they call ataxia everything. And it's extremely yeah. important, as you said, like the ataxia, yeah, vestibular cerebellar, they're pretty typical to recognize. And I think that we yeah. all are very used to and students to recognize a vestibular cerebellar ataxia. But then most of the cases, particularly with the cases we're going to talk today, that they are a, a cervical, whether um, higher or a little more caudal, they have some, some degree of paresis. And that paresis is what you don't see in brain diseases. So at least no kind of this difficulty walking and these like ugh, the steps that they, they have a little bit more difficulty taking. So I think that, uh, yeah, it is is not easy sometimes to, to differentiate paresis and ataxia. And sometimes they are definitely mixed there. So, guys, you need to ask questions because I have a lot of questions, but I'm not sure that you want to hear my questions. <laughs> Just keep going with so, yours and let's see if, what will come up and then we, yeah. kind of, we can alternate as we move along. Yeah, exactly. So I posted um, some of the, obviously, you, you've published like hundreds of, of papers about um, a, a cervical spondylomyelopathy. And um, the recent ones, um, they've been a little bit more directed towards, and I think that it's important that we talk about a little bit, not obscure uh, presentations, but maybe a little bit less known presentations, because I think that almost every owner knows about Doberman having Wobbler's disease, but then what about these, the young cases, these uh, large breed dogs with the osseous form that they are painful, that I have so many questions about those. And then definitely this recent paper about the Wobbler syndrome in German Shepherds. And I think that those we really, I completely agree with you that we need to talk about because, again, the generative myelopathy is a disease that it seems that every owner, every breeder, every referral vet knows. And then we're going to be missing. So um, how did you, so how many years, for how many years did you start seeing these German shepherds before you said, oh, actually, what is happening here? Yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a great question because I, I would say that, you know, I, I, I left Brazil in 2008 and I moved to Ohio like, to, to join the Ohio State University back then. And, and for the first year, because um, the service was shut down um, for a period, Dr. Philip March, which, who may or may not be your colleague, was there. He left. Everyone kind of left. Yeah, no, I know. I know he was at Tufts, but I, yeah, I wasn't there when, yeah, when he yeah, was yeah, so. in, at Tufts. Yeah, so he left Ohio, actually went to Tufts. Um, but the, so I got there, there wasn't any service, and I, said, I had to reestablish the, the neurology program from the, the ground up. And so the, the first year, we, we actually didn't have a, a full service. We kind of would see more emergencies and the urgent cases and like whatever case, but more like urgent cases, not like open to a point where you didn't have resident and stuff. So the second year, 2009, uh, September 2009 is when we opened the service. And I want to say that within one year, so 09, 10, I, I started having those cases. And it, it, it maybe it may had started with one. I want to say that probably it was around 11 or 12, 2011, 2012. 
when I got two or three within a, in a, in a matter of, I want to say maybe six, eight months. And I remember that back then, like none of those were even remotely considered like walkers, like, but even remotely, like yeah, nothing, yeah, yeah, yeah. people didn't cross their minds. Yeah. And I kind of said, what the heck is happening here? And I talked to some colleagues there. We had a, like a small group of neurologists from Ohio. I said, are you guys seeing? I said, man, 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 I'm not seeing those cases. And, and I remember that back then I contacted the, one of the associate editors of JAGMA. Mm -hmm. And I said, there is something happening here. Like something is, is coming and I'm seeing more and more um, wobblers in, in German shepherds, German shepherds for the Brazilians. Here, uh, not like um, that. Don't know what German Shepherd is. German Shepherd is a Pastor Lemo, like a very popular breed in Brazil. Mm. Um, and and I, I wrote to her and said, "Can I can I just write a letter? Can I just write a letter, like kind of a brief communication, yeah. just so you put on Jadma and and just to raise awareness of practitioners out there that." German shepherds are having wobblers, like they're having cervical spondylomyelopathy because people don't have any any clue, like they don't even think about it. And, and, and you know, in the, and obviously they have degenerative myelopathy, they have the spine, like the thoracic lumbar discs, they have yeah. lumbosacral disease, so they, and they have all the, like, and plus or, all the orthopedic stuff. So they got a lot going on for the pelvic limbs, for the, the, the yeah. pelvic limbs, and so they, they often have more severe weakness, more severe attacks in the pelvic limbs. But, and, and that was the tricky thing, that's what I wanted to highlight in my communication. Um, yeah. was that people need to start paying attention to the thoracic limbs. You can't just see, oh, yeah, he can, he's struggling to get up with the hind, he's weak in the hind, and you just yeah. ignore the front. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. just ignore. And so I, I reached out, out to her, and she said, you know what, I can't, like, we don't do that. You know, some, like, that record and some other journals, they, they would accept um, just, you know, brief letters and things, uh, but yeah. we don't. If you want to, if you, if you want to have to um, submit a full report, like just a case series, and, and, and you know, like it's life is complicated, you know, like as much as I publish, I still feel that I'm yeah. under accomplished because I could publish, I, I should have published in my mind two or three times more. Um, and that was one of the, 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 the projects that I had in the back of my mind. I said, I need to get that out. I need to get that out. And then, you know, like, but you know how, clinics is right you, you get like three cases of something that you don't see for years and then it kind of quiets down and then it picks up like like yeah. three four or five years later it, 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 you know that happened to me i think it happens to you too um and that happened i want to say like three or four years later and then i said okay I, I, now it's now we need to get that done and, and so then i got those 10 cases um Definitely, like those, it, 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 there are a few things, there, there are a lot of things to talk about this, this but I would say that there are a few um, points to highlight. The German Shepherds, they have the osseous form of cervical spondylomyelopathy, so lots of bony proliferation affecting the articular processes, the lamina. By the way, the, like for the, 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 those of you who are listening to us, and you say, well, I only have x-rays in my practice, you actually can and we, we have, ex and we did put in the, the paper, yeah. um, radiographs of, uh, uh, of cases, because you can actually really have a fairly good presumptive diagnosis of these cases based on survey radiographs only. Like you, like obviously you need MRI, you need CT, yeah, yeah, yeah. CT myelography to confirm this case. But based on, based on the, the, like just on the radiographic signs, the lesions are fairly classical. They're very typical. Like they're, they're massive proliferation, the lamina, massive proliferation affecting the articular processes, basically five, six, and C6, C7. But what I would tell you that the key thing is that most people, but by far, and this I will tell you, this is, when I say most people, I would say general practitioners and Neurologist. people that do neurology full time or do neurology yeah. partially, the, 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 you know, like some people just because the primary complaint is almost invariably focus in the hind limb because the hind limbs will be much worse because of other concurrent disease. Like yeah. in our case, seriously, I think 50% of the shepherds with wobblers also had called equina syndrome. Yeah. So the, it, it's that plus other things. And, and then there's so there are plenty of reasons for the pelvic limbs to be Weaker. worse, sometimes yeah. significantly worse. 
But if you pay attention to the thoracic limbs, that short strided gait, and that's a, and I understand why some people have difficulty with that, because if they're too weak in the pelvic limbs, they will shift the weight forwards. And as a consequence, you know, like when they, they, they bring their elbows under their chest and they'll have that short yeah. strided gait. And so it is difficult when you, when you don't make gait assessment a routine on your practice. Because if you do that, you will, because it's so common to see hind limb problems that, that it'll be easy for you to appreciate. Okay, I see dogs with hind limb weakness every day, but I don't see that kind of posture shifting the weight forward exactly. and bringing the elbow yeah. back so clear as I'm seeing in the shepherd. So then you, you create a pattern in your mind of what is normal and what is not normal. And you must, and there's no conversation, there's no point, there's no negotiation here. If you want to do neurology, you need to look at the gait. And the gait, and you need to be very good at the gait. And the gait is the key for these cases. Because I will tell you, like, even when I, I told you I was in Cambridge um, back in yeah. February. And, you know, it, it's nice to see that these cases are not just happening in the U.S. I was in Cambridge visiting for a week. Guess what? They think the first or second day that I was visiting them, their hospital, like a German shepherd comes with fine limb weakness. We started looking at the front limbs and all that. The dog had wobbles. A German Shepherd there, so mm -hmm. and I and I could see you know when the resident was examining the front limbs, how tricky it is and how hard it is to really support a big dog with a deep chest to check for perception. It is hard. It, it's hard for yeah. it's hard for everyone. You know how can you support a great day in a, like an animal that weighs many times more than the actual clinician? And so yeah. that's why I tell you like it's important to practice. It's important that you de try to develop those skills, but it's it's crucial that you 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 develop like a pattern pattern of gait assessment as a routine in your practice daily practice because that's the thing when you see yeah. the involvement of the limbs well obviously like all the hind limb issues you know the tl the lumbosacral the orthopedic well they can't be there and they are part of the disease but then you have to add a cervical myelopathy and obviously it can be disc disease it could be cyst it can be many things but I like I, if you localize the lesion to the cervical spine. I mean, I, I would say that like Walbert syndrome, cervical spondylomyelopathy needs to be up there. Yeah. And just to conclude, and because I, I think this is important, what we've noticed in our case series, um, I can't say broadly about the disease. I can tell you what I've noticed is that when we MRI these dogs, they had very bad lesions, like bad lesions, including the spinal cord, you know, those yeah. spinal cord signal changes, that hyperintensity, 90% of them had that, 20% had hypointensity in the spinal cord. Hypointensity. Hypointensity too. So, which does indicate a component, a clear component of chronicity and a component of severity too, which they could be like kind of hand in hand because people kept thinking that was a high limb for you know, like osteo associated yeah, yeah. cervical spondylomyelopathy is supposed to start at a young age. Well, if these dogs have been having this for, maybe they started when they were two, and they are yeah. now coming to a neurologist when they're six, seven, yeah. because that's kind of the age. Yeah. Well, they've been having a cervical myelopathy for five years. Well, yeah. clearly then there's the, the, the spinal cord lesion is very, very severely established. And related to that or not, I don't know. But th those dogs also had a very high percentage, but very, very high percentage. I want to say that 80% of dogs had very severe proliferation of soft tissue and ligamentum flavum, more than any, any other breed, more than any other report of fossil associated surgery. Yeah, no, the images that you put on the, on the paper, they, they, they are very severe. And, and as you said, it's surprising how old the, the dogs are, at yeah. least when they were presented, which is a little bit different. Yeah. So let me just ask a few questions that they've been coming through, which um, they are actually related to it. So we're going to start because you were talking about, and I think that this is a very interesting one, you were talking about the two engine gait also on these German shepherds, that the lesions for I could see on your paper, they are not only caudal, they are also some of them a little bit more cranial, dorsal, lateral compression. So. Um, someone was asking, how, what is the explanation? What is the justification for the two engine uh, gate on these cases? Yeah, very, very good question. So um, the reason why we, we, we see the two engine gate, and I'll step back a little bit so you can perhaps see my arm. Maybe I'll push this a little forward too. 
Um, so in that thoracic limb, when we look at uh, our arms, um, we have flexion and we have extension, okay, in different nerves. So flexion, like the cranial aspect of the cervical thoracic intumescence, and extension, which is more called. So dogs are normally like this. They're standing like this. So they're using a lot of the extensor muscles, like mm -hmm. radial nerve, flexor muscles, musculocutaneous nerve. These dogs typically have compressions at the main compression at five, six, 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 six seven. That's kind of where the, like the, 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 the most severe compression. That's where we, we often appreciate the spinal cord signal changes in these dogs. And with that, with a like kind of five, six, six, seven myelopathy, we are hitting the spinal cord segments, primarily C6, C7, C8 spinal cord segments. So for the students present here, we have seven cervical vertebrae, but eight spinal cord segments. And the lumbus uh, or the cervical thoracic plexus or the cervical intumescence goes from C6 to T2. C6, C7, C8, musculocutaneous nerve, basically flexion. C7, 8, 1, 2, radial nerve extension. So if you have a, a myelopathy centered in hitting the white and gray matter at around 5, like 5, 6, or C6, C7 vertebral levels, that would kind of, in the most patients, most dogs, I could say 70, 70 to almost 80%, would hit that C6, C7, C8 spinal cord segment and would interfere with flexion. So norm, the normal gait is a balance between basically as we're walking, we're kind of flexion, flexing and extending. Mm -hmm. Well, what happens when you kind of lose your ability to flex? You're kind of stiff. And as a consequence, the, the range of motion that you normally would because this is working normally, it's not. Mm -hmm. So you end up having a much shorter strided gait in the thoracic limbs than what you normally would expect. So that is the reason why we get that classic short strided, faster pace in the thoracic limbs and a longer stride, kind of much longer stride, this lower pace in the pelvic limbs is because we're dealing with a caudal cervical myelopathy centered at C6, C8, heating part or the heating to some extent, the mus musculocutaneous nerve that's responsible for innervating the flexor muscles mm -hmm. of the thoracic limbs. And importantly, if you say, well, but I'm not sure, I'm, I'm still not like, I feel I'm horrible at the a gate exam. Let's say you look at it and say, I'm horrible. I can't, I, I think it is, but I don't know. Is yeah. there a way that I can, in my examination, you know, to have a, like some sort of more direct evidence of my findings? Yeah. Yes, there is. When you check the, the thoracic limb reflexes in these dogs, if you were to check extensor tone, if you apply pressure here, mm -hmm. the extensor tone would be increased. And when you do the flexor reflex, when you try to do the flexor reflex, this dog would try to flex, mm -hmm. but he won't be able to flex. So he'll start the flexing movement, but he can't do the full flexion because there is an impediment or a dysfunction affecting the flexor function, like the, like the flexor muscles of that thoracic limb. Mm -hmm. um, very, very, like very, very common finding. Like that German Shepherd that I told you that I, we, like I saw a visit in Cambridge had the exact beautiful picture that I just described. Yeah. And do you, because sometimes also we see, I will say that it's not as dramatic as uh, with uh, spondylomyelopathy, with a caudal. Sometimes also when you have also the high thoracic lesions, you can have also a little bit like a two engine, but I don't know if we will call it two engine because it's true that anatomically is different, but it's true as a German yeah. Shepherd, you can have also that high thoracic. Uh, do you feel uh, that that kind of a little bit kind of little steps in the front with the high thoracic, it is a little bit different from the typical caudal cervical, no? It is. Yeah, it is. I, I have seen that in Shepherds. I've seen that in Bactions with T1, T2 extrusions. Um, you get that. And, and in those cases, you know, like, like they obviously wouldn't have the, the, the reflex changes that I described, you know, like the flexor reflex is intact, it wouldn't be affected at all. And I would say that the extensor tone may or may not be normal, but definitely wouldn't be increased, like what you see with those called the cervical myelopathies, because if they call the cervical myelopathies, you get a beautifully increased extensor tone. 
like upper motor neuron. Yeah. And then you also get that decreased flexor reflex. So if it goes T1, T2, T3, um, you, you, don't, you don't really get that. Yeah. You, know, you get more like a, you, the gait can be... Confusing, can, but yeah, the neuro is... Can be confusing, is, definitely can be yeah. confusing. Very good question because I, I have a beautiful video of a duction with, a, I think, a T1, T2 disc that that has a very short stride gate in the thoracic limbs. Mm. But those cases are also comparatively less common, I would say. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, definitely. So um, following with the question, which they are all related, so we're going to a little bit kind of joining questions together. So was someone was asking uh, what was more common, if the disc-associated or the bone-associated wobblers, and actually someone before asked about the theology. If someone has found what was the theology, and if someone is going to find what is the theology, it's going to be Ronaldo. <laughs> uh, well, I don't, I don't know if it would be me, but I, I can. it's good that we're talking about this because it gives me the opportunity to ask help, um, ask for help. And I, so we, we don't, so the ideology, that's a very complex, there's so many things. I, I could tell you that genetics most likely do play an important role. Um, we have found evidence of an autosomal dominant mode of inheritance in Dobermans. Mm -hmm. uh, we have not actually looked at that specific pattern in Great Danes, but we we are doing actually molecular genetic like kind of investigation at this moment. So if anyone like like kind of participating here um, happens to see a Great Dane like with like boxes associated cervical respondent myelopathy that's actually confirmed with whatever like it could be myelography it doesn't matter what yeah. how you confirm but you confirm that um please reach out to me because we're actually banking samples uh dna samples of these cases we did a preliminary analysis i would say three years ago or so and unfortunately uh even though we thought that we had like found a heat and mutation um, it didn't pan out when we actually did the more thorough analysis. But that process is underway. We're collecting samples. Um, and I would say we, at some point, we should be able to find a mutation. Um, so I, I, that's, that's a big thing. Uh, other than that, there, there are so many hypotheses about like nutrition, like head, big head, long neck, those things are out. Yeah. Like, you know, so we, we investigated those. It's not. There might be some imbalance, muscle imbalance. We're, we're, we're currently investigating that. Um, but I would say genetics would be the, the key thing because then we can do some genetic testing and selection and stuff like that. Um, so that, that's for, for etiology. Um, the other question was... Um, it was a bit oh, more like, common. Like the shepherds, was in the shepherds if we were seeing more disc or osseous? I, I think that in general, if it's more common... In general? If, yeah. Yeah, I guess it, it, it really depends on, on the population you... Uh, you the, the kind of breeds you have in your area. So yeah. I did... Um, I, I did my PhD, my residency at the Ontario Veterinary College in, in Guelph, in the kind of like southern part of Canada. And back then, and that's 18 years ago, we had but a lot of Dobermans in the hospital, but tons and tons of Dobermans. And we, back then, then I would say, and, and we would get Great Dane, but I'd say for my impression is that for every 10 Dobermans we would see, would get two, maybe three Great Danes, um, like by far. And then, you know, some random like Mastiff, like Weimar Runner, kind of Labrador, we'd get some random cases, but by far, like three, four times more than anything else were, were Dobermans. And as a, as a consequence, we were seeing primarily disc associated, and occasionally we'd get some osseous component or primarily osseous in a Doberman. I mean, there's overlap of these cases. Yeah. Um, when I went to, so that, that was between 2006 and 2000 and, no, 2002 and 2006, you know, came to Brazil, worked here for two years. Here I would see both, you know, I was working in Palutina, a city in the Paraná state, like very small city, like 25,000 people. And here in Palutina, I remember that I got great names, but I also got Dobermans. I, I, I got a little bit of everything, but not commonly, like I couldn't tell you any preference and, and we like that also between 2006 2008 working here you didn't have ct or mri it was just myelography but you know you could characterize the lesions um reasonably well i would say 
Um, when I went back to Ohio, I wanted to continue my line of research with Dobermans and Disc Associated Cervical Spondylomyelopathy Myelopathy because I had already published and done my PhD on that. And I was struggling and you know, like, and I have, because we've done so many studies, uh, a lot of these publications you see, guys, not all of them, but a lot of them, we actually paid for the MRIs. We, we have research yeah. funding and, and so people don't, don't, don't pay for their MRIs. And even, but that, that's a crazy thing, even offering free MRI for Dobermans, we couldn't find Dobermans. It was very difficult to recruit Dobermans. And then I, I was giving a CE lecture to veterinarians from Ohio, I think all, all states. And then a veterinarian that, who was also a breeder came to talk to me and she said, you won't find Dobermans here like not in central Ohio, not in Ohio, you should switch your research to Great Danes because we have plenty of Great Danes here. Yeah. Even though people say that they don't have the, we don't have a lot of lovers, we don't have a lot of CSM, we do. And I kind of, you know, I said, really? But and I initially said, well, like, but what about everything I've done? I said, fine, I will start <laughs> studying in, in, in Great Danes. And clearly it went beautifully well. And I got like, like plenty of cases, had no issue recruiting cases, like many, many, many cases. So I, I would say, you know, like in Brazil, there are some places where at least Rottweilers were popular. I mean, Rottweilers can have everything, but in theory, they're supposed to have more like the osseous associated form of the disease. Yeah. So if you work in an area that you see tons of Rotties, well, yeah. that's what you think. The same, Derma Shepherds, you're going to get osseous. Um, if you're looking at Labradors, Dobermans, Weimaraners, um, Dalmatians, yeah, probably more like disc associated. So I guess it, it really depends on what you see breed wise on your region. Yeah. We see both, but because of what I've just said in Ohio, I would say now probably, I don't know, 70% of our case load is osseous and 70 to 80 osseous and 20 to 30% disc associated. Yeah. Yeah, and then there is, again, I'm, I'm, I need to follow the questions that they've been coming up, but I have so many questions about that because then we have also all these other breeds that they have one or the other. Like I have Labradors that they do have the osseous form, like, and then you have all these mixed, but okay, I, I, I'll... But like just to, just to add this, uh, and because maybe we probably have, won't have time, like we looked at um, more than 200 MRIs we, that we had done in Ohio, okay? And that's a publication that will come up either late last late this year or next year but we we presented this at the ECVN meeting in Poland last year 25 percent when we look at all MRIs like all, all ECSM cases 25 percent of them have actually both 25 yeah. percent of dogs who have disc and yeah. osseous yeah. so it's important because the publications yeah. and including our own have been very kind of clear cut is disc or is osseous well like that's why like this paper will, will come probably next year where it will show that 75% follow this rule, 25% we have both. So just watch out for both. Yeah, and then how do you decide which is going to link very beautiful on to uh, questions that we have. So one question, because obviously then how do we treat these cases? And one very important question was, uh, does always MRI relate with the severity? Do the severity of the lesions on MRI relate with the clinical severity? Because I guess at that, how do we use or how, what parameters are we going to use to decide a treatment? Yeah, we are, um, that's a great question. Those are very, very good questions. Um, I would say overall, if you look at all the literature and even humans and a lot of stuff, because humans, um, we also have wobblers, you know, like they can, and in 10 years from now, uh, or even less, five years from now, like the prevalence of wobblers in people would increase dramatically because everyone is doing this, right? Like kind of like just like looking down and, and all of this. So it's already increased, but it's going to like, 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 like to a level that we have never seen in our lifetime. But um, we like in general, there's no correlation, generally speaking, between clinical signs and severity of spinal cord compression in general. However, um, I'm actually working in a, like we have a number of papers in like in kind of the pipeline that were already done a statistical analysis and things. And in the, the, the group of like disc associated CSM, it does appear there is a, there is a correlation between 
severity of neurological signs, like mm -hmm. rate of mild, moderate, and severe ataxia, with severity of spinal cord compression, also like mild, moderate, and severe spinal cord compression. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this is this is more like a, a population base. I think we have more than 60 MR of disc associated testing. But when you look at one individual patient, which I guess that's why the question is, like whoever asked that question, um, thank you, by the way. I would say that in many cases, there is a significant mismatch between what you see clinically and what you see on MRI. Like a lot of cases. Yeah. And I, I'd like to take that opportunity to, to and this, we won't have time to cover everything, but this is important. The reason why I think that we see that mismatch or we used to see that mismatch so often is because when we are, the, what is the typical position to MRI dogs with cervical disease? Yeah, you know, yeah. The typical position is that you basically just put the dogs like basically in their back mm. with their kind of neck and, you know, basically thoracic spine and neck all kind of lined up. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not how they are. But that's how we image them. I imagine that's how you image in yeah, 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 well. sure. endorsement. Um, and I, I kind of even, because I, I, I figured we would cross that bridge at some point, I wanted to kind of even, you know, I kind of got this here. Look at how, I hope you can maybe see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at, like, look at the neck <laughs> in relation to the thoracic spine and like in the both, like a, a real Scooby-Doo and a fake Scooby-Doo. Yeah. Um, and then someone said, like, enter the wobblinator, and that's exactly what it is. Yeah. Like, when you, when you image them, like, with their neck flat, like, like here, yeah. like, with this, like, just, like, a straight, like, that black, like, line behind the dog. Well, you're actually not truly representing everything that's happening in the cervical spine of that dog. When that dog is kind of moving, when he's walking, going up and down stairs, kind of getting a treat that he extends his neck. You know, like doing the normal kind of mm -hmm. daily things. And I mean, obviously, when they're very painful, they would keep their head down. But assuming that the dog is not in severe pain, they, they I mean, it's a you know, mild degree of pain. And most, that's yeah. typically what we see with the most longer cases. They, they rarely present with neck pain as a primary complaint. They're moving their head and keeping it like with, you know, I would say like whatever angle, but like with some degree of like angle like mm -hmm. this. Well, when you get them more like flat like this, it really doesn't represent the, the whole picture. And that I think it's it's why we have that mismatch so often when we look at individual cases because we see that. I, I mean, I can't also I've seen hundreds of cases and I, I've seen that so clearly. You look at the dog's gait, like severe attacks. You look at the MRI and you say, like, but like there, there's a mild compression five six. There's another mild yeah. six six seven. There's one that's compression about four or five. And, and, and by the way, like the more experience you get, the more you start looking at these cases, that's when you start to appreciate this, you know, this 25% of overlap between disc and osseous. I'd say for a lot of people that they just look at one MRI of randomly here and there, they would pick just the primary lesion. Okay, well, I think more ventral compression is probably disc. Yeah. Whereas someone, you know, may, may have a may look at it a little more careful and start to appreciate the articular processes, you know, like kind of the epidural fat all over it. And when you place these dogs in extension, like in the so-called wobblinator, right? Like that yeah. kind of kinematic MRI board that we designed. Um, I mean, that revealed lesions like that we couldn't see in 50 to 60% of cases. Yeah. You know, the cysts and, and things that, uh, like honestly, when I, when I, um, when I started doing that, because obviously at the beginning, like I was worried, right? Like, I mean, CSM, cervical spinal myelopathy is supposed to have a, a, a component, like a dynamic component. Yeah. But if I'm forcing these dogs into an extension and there's no protective muscles, yeah. like no protective mechanism, keeping that dog there for whatever, like, you know, I don't know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, what's going to happen if these dogs, you know, like I, I was very, very worried. Thankfully, I and mean, this is good information for everyone, I have never seen, never seen any dog worsen because of kinematic MRI. And before someone asks, um, 
but because you know I got that question too many times, so I'm I'm already going to ask mm -hmm. an answer. Oh, but like when they did the the, the kinematic position of myelography in the eighties, uh, like tons of dogs worsened, and that's why they stopped. Yes, I I'm fully aware of that, but I guess the combination of that less than ideal position for the spinal cord and the chemical meningitis caused yeah, by the compress yeah, medium, yeah. it's just enough to push the dogs over the edge. And that's why we, we, we get the dramatic worsening that truly happened, like with myelography. But it, I have not seen that at all with any case that we've done. And as a matter of fact, kinematic, kinematic MRI is now the standard of care for us at a high state. So we we'll do the neutral position in dorsal, like, like, you know, with the way we've always done, yeah. kind of this point, what we call neutral, which is not really neutral, but whatever, like we call it neutral. Yeah. And then we move on to the extension. We are not, uh, I do not do flexion as a routine um, because flexion added very little compared to if extension. And we have to, you know, we, we kind of need to work with like kind of, prioritize my time uh, and result in time exactly yeah, yeah. so you can't be spending two and a half hours to MRI every single case yeah um doing neutral and doing extension and getting sagittal and transverse t1 and t2 and all of that we can get that done in an hour and 20 an hour and 30 with no problem now <laughs> um that wasn't can I throw a question regarding imaging because we are not doing this for for next but I, I have been doing it for the LS and then going recently to some uh, neuro, so human um, uh, meetings, I used to use, I use a lot the Proset and the Dixon uh, views for uh, compression of the sciatic nerve. And I was just thinking, like, I never, you know, sometimes you have these dogs with severe foramina stenosis, with, with a, a, a nerve that is going to be compressed and then it could give you some pain. So have you experienced a little bit or have you used a little bit the Dixon or the process to look at that nerve? So have you no. also done any DTI on these cases? Because they also use we, a lot uh, for yes. pain, no? Humans, we, yeah. We've done um, we've done DTI. We are doing DTI. DTI, for those who don't, don't know what it is, it's diffuse intense for imaging. It's uh, um, with DTI, we get tractography, which you get some beautiful, very, very cool images. Mm -hmm. um, we, we've done in Dobrons, we've done in Great Danes. That's one of the papers that's on my to-do list. Okay. Uh, but we actually have a, a study going on right now, like not when we would do Robert if we want, but it's primarily focused on cervical discs, a uh, high state where we do, the, we do the routine MRI, we do DTIs with tractography. And then we we want to repeat the MRI 30 days later with tractography to see how the, the tractography, the DTI, changed comparing pre and post uh, uh, um, pre, pre and post operative operatory MRIs. And yeah. we have um, um, we're enrolling patients. I don't know how many we have thus far, um, but the the issue of foramen stenosis is a great one. It's a very tricky one. You know, like I had. Uh, in my like a lot of the kind of the basis of my PhD thesis, like the hardcore basis, was that there was, and, and I think there there's there's still the, the chance that there is some sort of intermittent kind of extension movement related. I, I hypothesized that mm -hmm. 17, 18 years ago, um, sort of intermittent but chronic kind of ischemia affecting the spinal cord related to the foramen of stenosis mm -hmm. kind of being kind of the, yeah. the foramen being kind of yeah. like narrow, like either like dorsal ventral or kind of cranial caudal. The issue is, and um, I, I honestly, I'd love to hear your opinion on this because we've looked at the, the MRIs and transfers, we've looked at the sagittal or parasagittal to look at the cranial caudal extent. And we, we know we really extension does worsen the, for the degree of foramen stenosis significantly. I want to say kind of 30%. But the problem is when we looked at the MRI of normal Great Danes and normal Dobermans, mm -hmm. like if I'm not mistaken, 69% of normal Dobermans have foramen stenosis. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. It, it, it's a very high percentage. and. And it kind of like, I'm sure in human meetings, you know this, 
it's like the normal population like you know when you're kind of over 40 50 60 what is the percentage of normal humans with like for stenosis on mri like you're clinically normal but you have for stenosis like high yeah. i want to say 60 percent yeah um why some people have horrible pain like i have back pain i have sciatica right now uh why some people suffer with that and some people some people don't um no one knows you know it's just it's just the nature of it, it, it yeah is. why why you get some dopamine why you get some great dance with severe form stenosis on mri and they are they don't have any evidence and i've done emg on these cases because when I started to identify and I would see no clinical signs, I said, okay, clinically we don't appreciate, but I must find something on EMG. E EMG is electromyography, guys. Yeah. Um, it, it really picks up. It's a high, like very, very sensitive test. Well, the EMG was normal. Yeah. So it, it's, it, is, it is harder than, than it appears, and I, I don't know And do you think is. that because sometimes they be using these and I stop it because I know this all the questions there, but they've been starting to use a lot of so this DTI for like the trigeminal uh, compression in humans also to predict um, uh, the recovery or the success after the compression uh, surgery. So I don't know. It would be nice if actually we could be digging a little bit more if tactography could be a little bit the answer, but I, I don't think that we are there. At all, no, know. no, I don't think we're either. And uh, the cases we've we've done, the the, the actual Wobber cases, I, I don't. I mean, I, I told you, like we we collect those cases that needs to be analyzed and you know kind of really, really yeah. properly analyzed. Look at the other images, features, and clinical and stuff to correlate. But um, with this pre pre and post operative DTI case uh, project with cervical discs. We're, we're, I mean, we're hoping to to at least gain some insights because you know it's a much that's really cool, yeah, easier, cleaner population to look into. That's still we're still focusing on cervical spine, yeah. So hopefully, in one or two years, we'll be able to <laughs> give us some you know, like report. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so then uh, another question, which is uh, one of our residents, Mimi, that she's, even if there is no exam, she's studying. So she has taken a break to come to listen. Um, and she, and um, she was asking, um, yeah, if there is at any point you think that you can see a future where we can screen these cases a little bit early in life and then screening them earlier, if we could envision some type of action we could take instead of just waiting until they have this severe and chronic lesion at six, seven years old, where sometimes they are pretty irreversible. Um, I would tell you that that would be ideal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this younger generation, like, like is she a third year resident? Yes. She is okay. So in theory, you would be the like you'd be the smartest that you can be in your life in the next month or so. Like from that point forward, it just starts to go downhill because just before the exam, you could be smarter. And you really you have accumulated so much information in your mind that you're like a borderline genius. Yeah. Uh, now it's tricky because the, the poor creatures can't even take their exam. I know. I know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So that's a very unfortunate situation. But I, I would say that would be wonderful. That would be great. I can't tell you how we could that, uh, how we could do that, unless we effectively, you know. And, and trust me, I have, I have spent much more time thinking about this disease than I probably should, than most <laughs> normal people would ever spend thinking about a soul thing. And and. Mostly because I could tell you, like, since we have residents here, I find it highly annoying. I find Wobber syndrome highly annoying. Like, I, I, I used to hate it because I did my master's in surgery. I worked in general practice, and I, you know, it was kind of like a, a good mix of like medicine clinician, but surgical person too. I did my master's in surgery, which which was kind of a combination of residents and surgery. And I remember like reading about this, this is again, 1996, 1997, and thinking, I said, this is a clueless kind of people disease. I mean, all these surgeons doing these implants and things, yeah, they don't have yeah. any idea what this disease is. This is just 
like for the lack of a better word, purely stupid. And I, I like in, in like life is quite ironic, right? And and I love epilepsy. I really love epilepsy. And I went to Guelph to work with Dr. Pahan on epilepsy because he was like one of the biggest names back mm. then, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And I got there and we we work on two, three projects, uh, try to work on two, three projects on epilepsy and they failed miserably. And then I, I was kind of, and then she said, you know what? Why don't you work with wobblers? I said, really? <laughs> and I, I like, but by then, I, you know, it was late and we had already wasted a year. And I, I said, what the heck? Fine, I will do this damn wobbler project. And the, but then being me, I said, okay, like this is a disaster. This is like a, like a big mass. What, like, how can this be like this? So let's start, start studying the normal dogs. And that's when I found like the 25% of normal dogs have spinal cord compression. Yeah. You know, 100% of those have had disc protrusion, normal dogs. Like, you know, like it was a disaster. Yeah. I said, well, now I understand why it's so problematic, this damn disease. And so looking at imaging, because I've tried to get dogs, like normal dogs, and said, okay, let's just x-ray dogs, like, yeah. not like in laboratory cumbis, in standing, like they do in horses. Yeah. Like, very, very difficult to get a dog, Doberman or Great Dane to stand against the wall yeah. and get radiographs and get measurements and try to do that yearly. Uh, like, so I can't find any any um, way other than a, a genetic screen yeah. at an yeah. earlier age before they yeah. breed, obviously that we can actually use to effectively um, avoid and, and, you know, like identify these cases at a much younger age. But, and our, I would say we're not super far from that. We, we, we have enough, we don't have enough, but we have a decent number of both normal and affected Great Danes, like at least just for Great Danes, not documents. And if anyone wants to share um, blood of like DNA of uh, dogs um, with, um, also, so it says, and I would gladly take it because we need more numbers. Okay, yeah, no, it's um, and also the thing is that the problem is the the biomechanics. Yeah, it's complicated because it is a it is a dynamic disease. So um, uh, even if we thought that it's all into the biomechanics, are we going to be smarter than the body to create something that is going to um, replace the beautiful mechanic of a healthy spine. Uh, it's going to be tricky. I don't think so. No. 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 Um, no. so another question. So there was someone asking about um, maybe this is. I think that it will be good that we kind of uh, make sure that we don't mix the osseous versus with the discs because someone was asking, could an osseous form of wobblers? Or well, could I, I don't know if this person thinks that. The typical progression of the osseous form of wobbler leads into disc extrusion, which so actually, mm, yeah. No, 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 no. They're, they're, actually, disc extrusion. So let's just start to separate things. Disc extrusion is not part of the, the of wobbler syndrome. Disc extrusion is so the type one form of disc extrusion described by Hansen, 1952. That is. That's a standalone form of the disease that can happen in a like it like not it can happen in any breed. I have I don't think I've seen in a great name, but like cervical. But I've definitely seen plenty of dopamines. But that that's not part of what we're seeing. That's just intervertebral disc extrusion in whatever breed. You see that and like it's classic of chondrostrophic, but it can happen in any breed. But uh, dogs can have just the osseous form of cervical spondylomyelopathy. Which um, we, we, you know, we, we we were. I think you alluded to the juvenile, the young dogs earlier, and we won't have time to talk about all yeah. of that. But I, I would say that most dogs, with the osseous form of CSM, they they probably really start with osseous changes around one year of age. Um, there are some, and we've looked to identify a good number of cases younger than one year of age being very clinically affected. But I'd say a lot of them start at around one year of age, and then we identify them, like diagnose them, diagnose them when they're about three, um, three, four, give or take. They, that doesn't necessarily lead to, um, to a disc-associated form of the disease. Clearly, though, if those dogs, let's say you do no intervention, intervention 
and you medically manage those dogs, and so you diagnose it is when the dog was three, four years old, and you let the dog live his life. Um, and a good chunk of dogs when they're around four, you see intervertebral disc degeneration, not disc protrusion, just the degenerative de yes. change affecting the disc. If you wait two, three, four years, could those dogs develop disc protrusion? Yeah, I'd say so, and I'd, I'd say there's a fairly decent chance that that will happen. And so you you could also see that, you know, like at one time point, the dog only had osseous associated surface monitor myelopathy. If you look at that same dog three years later, four years later, you could have a worsening of, you know, all the osseous changes and some component of disc associated. I don't think that's very common. I don't think that's just, you know, I'm just saying like to, 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 to allude to the specific question yeah. that was asked. We are uh, in the process, hopefully have, have a paper maybe accepted this week, next week on JVIM, where we did a long-term MRI follow-up of dogs with osseous associated cervical spondylomyelopathy. So they were diagnosed, they only had cervical spondylo uh, osseous associated CSM. We waited minimum of two years to repeat the MRI. Mm -hmm. Minimum of two years. So all the dogs we've done, they had, like, I think the average was like 29 months, something like that. What we've noticed is that we've noticed primarily progression of the osseous lesions, not in all cases, but we've noticed progression of the osseous lesions. We didn't really appreciate development of disc-associated CSM in that population. But again, that's kind of two and a half years. So yeah. like, do you know if that's not going to happen in five years? Yeah. Uh, no, I do not, but no one does either. But yeah, but as you say that, I mean, every dog also at a certain age, they're going to have a fever in the generation, the, the, the discs are going to get dehydrated, which may be, depending on the age of the dog, may be a normal progression. And then, of course, uh, when the disc is, disc is dehydrated, then depending, there is some underlying instability that could obviously predispose to protrusion, but there is not a direct link between having a nauseous form and then having a disproportion. No, and definitely not. And by the way, just because you mentioned stability, I think I just want to mention that. If you look at, like, in, because I've done some post-mortem in those cases, when you look at those those dogs with, like, such a, a big, massive articular processes, all those articular processes, like the synovial fluid gone, and, like, really, really market degenerative changes, you, you look at that many times, you can actually see the intervertebral mobility is reduced, is not increased. You know, so could, you know, if yeah, the yeah, yeah. Is, yeah. It, it was probably before the whole thing started, but when they have like those massive articular processes, they actually have a restricted intervertebral motion because yeah. it's just everything is arthritic. The body is trying to compensate, right? It's trying to exactly, or, well, or trying yeah. to compensate or just creating bone for whatever reason. But yeah. you, you, you don't have like at that time instability, but you, you know, like when the most proliferative bone disease we have is like dish you know, that diffuse yeah. idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. Yeah. And there is all that bone proliferation and the, the intervertebral discs are healthy. <laughs> so the, it, it's just tricky, you know, there's not yeah. a direct correlation that we can, we can yeah. say. Well, guys, thank you so much. Uh, Instagram is telling us that there's only one minute 20 left of our Insta Live. Uh, thank you so much, Ronaldo. We will keep, uh, I would have stay hours talking because obviously there is all the big list of other questions, but I'm sure that will be plenty of times to ask them. Um, yes, definitely. And you know, guys, that we're uh, going to yeah, put this... Uh, I very much appreciate your invitation for like to do this and to, to talk to you a little bit about it. I think there's the number of questions and the number of people participating indicating that indicates that... Yeah, no, I... Uh, like we all have questions about it and, and so it's good to talk about it. And yeah, no. share it. I wouldn't say the little bit that we've done, but what we have done, which, you know, over the years, this does account to, to be a decent amount. Yeah, no, that was really nice. And I think that you gave the very, very good tips and practical tips, which, which I think that everyone likes in here. And you know, guys, that we save these records and you can watch them all and then listen to every single detail so that you don't forget <laughs> anything. And uh, some people that they were asking the papers, I put, the pa put some of the papers on the story so you can look it up, especially the German Shepherd Wobblers. And Insta Live, bye-bye, bye-bye.